everybody, Richard again here from Electric Classic Cars and today we're going to be having a little bit of a discussion about why people convert beautiful iconic classic cars like this to electric. Now it's fair to say it's a little bit of an emotive subject. Some people out there love what we do but others not so much and I would probably say I was in that camp not so long ago but Having done what we do for, what, seven years now, I'm definitely convinced that electric power plants in classic cars give them a new lease of life and don't really take much away from the classic car experience. But let's get into it. Let's talk about the heart and soul of the car first, the engine. There she blows. Now here we have what people sometimes refer to as the heart or soul of a classic car, which is the engine. And then the Series 1 E-Type Jag, it's a 3.8 litre straight six. It's got twin cams, SU carbs, and you know, it's a lovely looking thing. And it sounds glorious as well. Don't forget, I used to be a petrol head and still have a massive appreciation for all types of cars. But is it a sin to take this out and put in an electric motor? So let's get into it, pros and cons. So one of the most common questions we get asked at shows is, but don't you miss the noise? And well, okay, on an E-Type Jag, it's quite a glorious sound when the engine is uh, burbling away and revved up. A little bit like a Spitfire flying over is a lovely noise. Uh, followed by a jet, eh, not so much. But you've got to understand that, you know, it's only 50% of the cars that we convert, you know, I would say have quite a nice noise to them. The other 50% are, you know, engines like a, a Fiat 500 engine, which, you know, I don't think anybody's kind of said that's a glorious noise that comes out of that, or a diesel engine out of a Land Rover, for instance. So, yes, noise is something that, you know, is not there with an electric converted uh, classic car, but believe me, you don't miss it. And I'm talking from experience, and it's always a good idea to listen to people that have experience, not opinion. So my experience is that there's so many other advantages that they far outweigh the fact that the noise is gone. And anybody that's driven to classic Le Mans in a 911 with open trumpets behind you and didn't put ear defenders on after about an, half an hour, you know, knows what I'm talking about. Noise is great, but there are certain limits. So there's no getting away from it. You know, the sound of the engine does go when you convert it to electric, but the benefits far outweigh it. Now here's the big one and it's the one I don't get the most. Soul. Why has this got soul but apparently this does not have soul? This apparently has the ghost of James Brown in it because it's full of soul but this is a washing machine to some. I've been into classic cars all of my life and I've never thought of an engine having soul. Okay, its soul has leaked out over the driveway a number of times, but I would say that they have personality, but a soul is a stretch, I think. Um, and a classic car has personality, no matter what engine's in it. But for those that say, this is the soul of a car, please explain below in the comments, why has this got soul and this does not have soul? And if you're gonna say, or if you don't understand, you know, if you don't know, you won't understand or whatever. That's lazy. I need an explanation. Why has this got soul? Let's talk about originality then, because there's no getting away from the fact that when you take the original engine out of the car, it's no longer how it was when it came from the factory. But why is that such an issue? Because people have been modifying and improving cars, classic cars, since year dot. Um, an AC Ace is a perfect example. AC Ace, great car. And then somebody came along and put a big massive American V8 in it and called it the AC Cobra. It's kind of the same things we're doing here, isn't it? You know, modifying and improving on the classic car design. Um, and the other thing is, these are mass produced vehicles. I mean, if you look at, say, a VW Beetle in front of me over there, 26 million of those were made. So, you know, these aren't like the Mona Lisa, as people say. Oh, you're painting a moustache on the Mona Lisa. No, there was only one Mona Lisa painted. Questionable. There's a few apparently out there. But um, 
this is not a piece of art. This is essentially something that should be driven and enjoyed. Piece of art, you look at it, and there's only one of them made. So you know, originality, um, yes, we are doing something which is you know, no longer an original car, if you like, but don't forget we're bolting in our conversions. So the conversions that we do, the motors and the battery packs, they bolt into things like the engine mounts and you know, the infrastructure of the car. We're not cutting and welding and messing around uh, with you know, the original car. And you know, I've been in the hot rod scene uh, quite some time and they definitely do that there. So if a customer ever did want to actually bolt back in his engine and his petrol tank and exhaust, etc., they can. But of the 100 plus cars we converted in the past seven years, not a single customer has done that. Now, one subject always gets brought up is manufacturing batteries is environmentally bad. Well, I've got news for you guys. Manufacturing anything is environmentally bad. I mean, you've got to dig out the raw materials out of the ground and process it, etc., to make anything in this world. Look at the cement industry and aluminium industry if you really want to look at very energy intensive processes. But batteries, the thing that always gets brought up is cobalt and child labour and link those two together with electric cars. And okay, there are child labour issues in the Democratic Republic of Congo and they're, you know, the kids are getting used in mines, copper mines and all sorts of mines and also cobalt mines. But does it ever get mentioned about other mines? No, it's mainly cobalt they concentrate on. The other thing to bear in mind is cobalt is used in the steel industry, in other industries, including the petrochemical industry to desulfurize petrol. So, so you're making petrol, you're also using cobalt, which gets used once. And the other thing with batteries is they can get recycled. So you can take the materials out and reuse them again. But the main big headline to take away from cobalt side of things is Tesla and other manufacturers are already moving away or have moved away from using cobalt and nickel because they're starting to use what's called LFP batteries, which is lithium ion phosphate. Um, so, yeah, cobalt is, has been used a lot in batteries in the past and will go into the future using them. But obviously, manufacturers like Volkswagen and Tesla are already going towards LFP batteries. Right, another thing that always comes up is weight. Surely when you put a battery in, it's going to collapse the car because it's so heavy. I think most people there are probably thinking about lead-acid batteries in milk floats in the 1970s. Because when we convert a classic car to electric, the weight is around about the same. At worst, it's maybe a little bit heavier, like maybe one passenger in it. But usually its weight is the same. But the other benefit with batteries is you can move the weight around. So you can have a front battery pack and a rear battery pack and improve the handling of the car. And anybody that also worries about weight is, look at how heavy cars have become from the 1970s to where we are now. Cars have been getting generally heavier and heavier and heavier over the decades. And has anybody ever moaned about weight? No, it's only when electric cars came out, which were a little bit heavier again, but not by much. Now, another big question we always get asked is, how much does it cost to convert a classic car like this to electric? And there's no getting away from it. It's expensive, very expensive. To convert a classic car, or any classic car really, to uh, electric, to a professional standard, and to safety standards like R100, etc., it's an expensive thing to do. I think the cheapest conversion we do is around about £20,000, and I think customers have spent up to £120,000 on converting a classic car to electric. There's a lot of man hours in it, a lot of parts, um, you know, batteries, motors, etc. So it's, it's expensive to do this. So that's all the cons, if you like, or negatives. Let's see if I can persuade you on some of the benefits of converting a classic car to electric. Right, let's get into the benefits. I think we should start with why I got into electric conversions in the first place. I, as you probably know already, was a massive petrol head and I just wanted to follow the power. And I put an electric motor in a car, put my foot down and just thought, wow, where has this been all my life? So performance is a massive benefit for converting a car to electric. Um, take this Defender, for instance. I mean, the Nord 60 in this was measured in hours, I think. Now, with electric drivetrain in, the Nord 60 is four seconds. 
And if you've seen my own Land Rover Defender, that's been tuned a little bit, not 60 and three and a half seconds. So it's fair to say performance is vastly improved when you convert a classic car to electric. And it doesn't need to be insane, or, you know, that's definitely the, the flavor that I like. But you can, you know, look at, say, a Fiat 500 just behind Tim there. We, when we convert that to electric, okay, that had a uh, power in, uh, of, what, 12, 14 horsepower, whatever, original engine. We don't go stupid with the power in those, but we do put a bit more power in so that you can safely drive around and keep up with modern traffic. So performance is a definite big plus when you convert a classic car to electric. Now, I'm going to give you a clue as to what this next subject is all about. By turning the key on the Jensen, it still has its engine in. Oh dear, nothing's happened. Reliability is this topic, and it's fair to say um, reliability is something you have to take into account with classic cars. I mean, me and Tim have been into classic cars since we were 17, and you know, you've had a fair number of classic cars, haven't you? Yeah, we've had our fair share over the years, haven't we? And you know, re reliability is not great with classic cars because they're old. And you know, as I get older, and certainly Tim gets older, <laughs> he becomes less reliable. But you know, with a classic car, you know, you have to have knowledge of how to you know look after that car and fix it, but also some good mates to phone at ten o'clock at night to say, uh, "Tim, can you come pick me up? It's broken down again." And um, you know. Since I've converted my own classic cars to electric, I've had 100% reliability out of it. I'm not saying that because I do what I do. I'm perfectly honest here. I've had 100% reliability out of the crew cab, for instance, um, which is six years ago I converted that to electric, and it's been my daily driver, and it just, you turn the key, and on it goes, and you get on your journey, and enjoy your journey, and, you know, get on with your life. So having something which is... 100% reliable is a good thing. Right, let's talk about maintenance. Now, anything that is 50 odd plus years old is gonna need a high amount of maintenance. As Tim's wife has told me many times, <laughs> he's high maintenance. So, with a classic car that's being converted to electric, it's still a classic car. You're still gonna need to maintain things like the brakes and other bits and pieces on it, just not this bit. And obviously this was the bit that probably took the majority of maintenance because um, you know look at it it's you know a, an inefficient thing it needs you know belt changing oil changes filter changes tune-ups you know what else is there i've, I've, I've forgotten spark now. plugs it's spark plugs you know there, there's so many things that you need to do to babysit this thing to keep it alive and you know performing to its optimal level, or, or just like the Jensen, just to get it started sometimes. So the maintenance side of things is, you know, there's a lot less maintenance you have to do to a classic car that's being converted to electric because the majority of the maintenance um, problem, if you like, goes away. Right, for this next topic, I'm gonna to need our glamorous assistant, Debbie McGee, or Tim as we like to call him. All right, come on in, Tim, you're gonna to have to rev up this. If I hold this on here, oh. all right, that'll do, that'll do, that'll do. Jeez, I can stay at that. So let's talk about this stuff. Um, essentially, what comes out of here is poisonous. So a fossil fuel, um, petrol or diesel that's burnt in an internal combustion engine, what comes out of the tailpipes will kill you, quite frankly. And that poisonous gas, if we rerouted that to inside the passenger cell, you'd be dead within a few miles. And that's not a good thing. But equally, what goes into the um, fuel tank itself is not a good thing. So actually digging oil out of the ground and refining it and shipping it halfway around the world, then be taking it to a petrol cell, all that is a bad idea. Uh, so you know, we're trying to move away from you know, this poisonous death gas to a cleaner power source, which is electricity. And there's people on their sofas right now, steam coming out of their ears, going, yeah, you're just moving the problem down the power lines to the power stations, etc." But consider this. In the UK, less than 2% of our electricity comes from coal. And last week, half the electricity produced in the UK came from renewables. So 
that is improving with time as well. I mean, uh, two-thirds of our electricity in the UK comes from low to zero carbons, and nuclear is included in that. And as the years progress, our electricity mix is getting cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. But this, the pollution coming out of this, will always remain the same, because when you burn petrol or diesel, the pollutants are the same. Electricity getting cleaner. So there you go, massive environmental benefits to using and driving an electric car. Now, earlier on, we discussed that the cost of conversion is very high, but there are financial benefits as well, which is the running costs, because I, I did a calculation a few years ago on my VW bus, and I worked out it was 16 times cheaper to run that than when it was petrol, and I was taking into account fuel, maintenance costs, and all the servicing um, parts and stuff like that, and I added up, like, five years prior, five years afterwards. 16 times cheaper, but bear in mind I've got solar panels and I'm also partial to a bit of free charging now and again. But there's no getting away from it. Running an electric car is a lot cheaper than running a petrol car. But as far as payback is concerned, you're going to struggle if you're going down the, the, the path of, oh, but when would you pay back, etc., the conversion costs? Uh, I'm not sure you would in a decent time frame because the upfront cost is so expensive. But again, it's a little bit like saying, oh, that lovely patio that you did in your house, what's the payback period of that? I d didn't really do it from a financial point of view to you know, get a payback. I just did it because it's a good thing to do and there's so many other benefits. But yep, cost of running an electric classic car is definitely a lot, lot lower, especially if you've got a high maintenance, high cost car like a Ferrari to start with. Now, another benefit of converting a beautiful classic like this to electric is we're essentially future-proofing it, not just for future generations to enjoy and drive, but I'm talking about low emission zones in cities. At some point, more and more cities are going to roll out low emission zones where they're either going to ban internal combustion engines or seriously, seriously put you off driving into those areas. And making a beautiful classic like this electric, well, no problem, you can drive in there. And at some point in the further future, petrol is going to become a very rare and expensive commodity as well. And anybody that thinks synthetic fuels is going to replace that, do the maths on how much energy it takes to produce synthetic fuels, because that ain't going to work. A little bit like hydrogen. So, yeah, we're going to future-proof vehicles by converting them to electric. But for me, the biggest benefit of all is the improved drivability of a classic car once it's been converted to electric. And there's people out there scratching their head thinking, how can it be a better driving experience once it's electric? Well, I'll try to explain. I mean, there's no getting away from the fact that performance-wise, electric is much better and faster. So performance is fantastic when it's converted to electric. Handling is better. Why? Because we can move the batteries around as, uh, as ballast, if you like, to improve the weight distribution. The, the brakes are better because essentially you've got regenerative braking from the motor. So you've got better performance, better handling, better brakes, instant torque for accelerating and overtaking, and it's just an overall better experience. And when you also add in you know, the less stress because reliability is better, you're not worrying about whether or not it's going to break down because there's a rattle or a noise, etc. The whole experience for me is better, but it's definitely one of those things you have to experience. So... There you go. That's the, all the pros and cons I can think of. I've probably missed out loads. It's been a while since I've had a, a petrol classic car, so I've probably missed out maybe some of the benefits and maybe some of the cons of um, owning a, a petrol classic car. But also EV guys, what have I missed out benefit-wise of like, uh, owning an electric car? Have I missed out anything there? Comments below. Let's have a discussion on it all. And hope you enjoyed this episode, and I'll see you on the next one.